happens, I forget to unmute it. <laughs> okay, alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all. Thank you for joining us, and especially to you, dear brother Karim. Um, once again, we're uh, privileged by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to share some time and um, uh, share some thoughts and knowledge, hopefully, that will increase our insight into what we love uh, about what it is that Prophet Muhammad brought to us and um, what happened as a result of uh, disobedience, as a result of um, steering away from his um, example, even though people claim that they are following his example, which is um, um, yeah, remarkable, to say the least. <laughs> you see, um, whether it is... Um, the Sunni or the Shia uh, persuasion or anywhere in between. Um, if I remember correctly, there is a hadith that says something about um, 72 or 73 sects. And um, there's only one uh, sect, if you will. And that is the sect that uh, obeys our Quran, that obeys the scriptures uh, brought to each population, you see. Um, I mean, there were 124,000 prophets, and uh, the Quran states we make no difference between any of them, you see. And um, there's a, a definite difference uh, between what Muslims profess and what the Quran states, you see. So the Muslim professes to follow the Quran, and yet they favor above all these uh, prophets, Muhammad. Now, I'm not negating the importance of Muhammad at all, God forbid. However, however, <laughs> you see, there is a universal position, and I'm not discussing perennialism here, there is a universal position where people all over the world have been invited to Islam by their own prophets, you see. And um, this is made very clear in our Quran. And our Quran does not state anywhere, to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, dear brother, after I pass the microphone to you, um, uh, Al Quran does not state anywhere that um, uh, part of the requirement for salvation and to get into the heaven of the afterlife, there is a heaven of the present life, by the way, but the heaven of the afterlife, you see, it doesn't state anywhere that you have to stand up and profess before God and man that uh, uh, Muhammad is uh, his prophet and the one to be followed. There are others you see. And there are people all over the world who have remained faithful to the best of their ability uh, in the path, the way, the Tao, if you will, of their prophets, you see. And just because Muslims have failed to have a look at the ways of these other prophets uh, doesn't mean that um, they are exceptional. They are exceptional in one way, however, and that is in professing that they are the ones who possess the only path. And they're on the only path, which means they become just like Christians uh, who say, well, the only way into heaven is through Jesus. And like Jews who say, look, you know, we're, we're, the, we're the chosen ones. We're the only way you're going to get salvation. So um, we've got a problem. Muslims have a problem with this kind of chauvinist attitude. And then, you see, it's compounded by all the sectarian persuasions, which have to do also with the madhabs, you see. Now, we know that there's four, maybe six madhabs, and there's probably more that we don't discuss and know about. Um, but um, in any case, 
it wasn't the founders of these madhabs, to my knowledge, that um, created the sect. They were just doing their best at the time to understand what the prophet had uh, brought. They were doing their best to understand the message. It is their students who created the sectarian uh, persuasion and then went into inter-madhab competition with one another. The first thing I was confronted with, well, there were two things I was confronted with when I entered the Muslim Ummah as a privately converted Muslim. I mean, I, I no one preached to me. I read the Quran and I decided that was the way for me and that was it. But then when I began to associate with organized Islam, I had a problem. I didn't have a sheikh. I didn't need one, you see, to begin with. <laughs> I mean, there was no sheikh coming to me and telling me, hey, you've got to be a Muslim, all right? There was no one beating me over the head with the Quran. I took it off the shelf and I said, I'm going to read this book finally. It's been sitting on my shelf for years. So I finally read it and I said, hey, gosh, this is, this is the way for me to go. I'm going to walk this path. No sheikh. Okay. <laughs> if, I, if I had a sheikh, it was... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by virtue of the angel who brought the message to our beloved prophet and by virtue of the people who were faithful enough to record it, which is one of the reasons I took the name Zaid, <laughs> you see. Um, and if you know that history, you know what I mean. So I had all this knowledge before I became a, a, a Muslim. Then I walk into Mus the Muslim uh, territories controlled by their imams and you know there's these these little fortresses they have called mosques and madrasas everywhere and uh, the first thing I, they want to know is who's my sheikh and which madhab i belong to and i say well what's that got to do with anything you know it, it you know they're, they're they're already judging me you see without having any taking any time to listen to what Allah has placed in my heart and whatever knowledge it is that I am bringing into the Ummah by virtue of my previous experiences and studies, okay, which is substantial. Now, that bias is the result of propaganda. That's what it is. This kind of propaganda results in confirmation bias, it results in uh, compounded ignorance, the bias of compounded ignorance, which means that you're the only one who has the right path to God, you see, and uh, you're going to demand, you're going to take the authoritarian position to demand that I do such and such and perform such and such and go to so and so in order to become part of your society and in that society ultimately represents those who are going to be saved in the hereafter please who taught you all this nonsense who taught you all this nonsense because that's what it is and i'm scratching my head you see for the first several years and then i i come across certain things for example, like the book, um, I think the book by uh, a fellow, Fazlur Rahman, uh, called uh, the, the Hadith Wars. I come across that uh, a couple of years later and I say, hey, well, maybe this is the reason, you see, that all of these fools are running around uh, with their sectarian nonsense and marginalizing people like myself and each other. I mean, I was in a society that uh, in, in, in Malaysia, that not too many years before I entered the Ummah there, they would, they refused to let Chinese Muslims enter their Malay masjids because they were Chinese. Where is this in Al Quran? So what I'm saying here in a nutshell is that had it been for the example of the Malay Muslims in particular, um, I would never have become a Muslim. Never. It was because of the Holy Quran that I became a Muslim. 
and remain a Muslim. No other reason. Okay. No, that doesn't mean that uh, other peoples from other um, countries who claim Islam are any less chauvinistic. Oh my God, they're worse. And I edited the, the uh, social study papers and psychological papers that prove it. It's established fact. The worst amongst Muslims, the worst chauvinist amongst Muslims are those from the Middle East, the, worst, the very worst. And this is the result of sectarianism. This is the result of, hey, I'm the one. Islam belongs to me. I speak Arabic. That was another problem I had. No one took me seriously because I didn't speak Arabic. Oh, my God. It, does that make me less of a human being? Does that make my cerebral pudding less than yours? Am I less worthy? Am I less pious? Please, where is this written in our Quran? It's not there. So what we're involved with in our discussions here with uh, our dear brother Karim is uh, the elucidation of the history and the ideas the psychological and the philosophical mm -hmm. positions that led to this outrageous chauvinism, which is actually destroying Islam. There's a, there's a, a passage, I, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, brother, there's so many things I need to be corrected about, um, that says, um, hey, um, if you don't obey, then I'm going to replace you, you see. This is Allah speaking to the Muslims. If you don't do what you're contracted to do with me, according to this um, arrangement that we have between us and uh, according to this um, uh, divine, divinely guided uh, um, agreement, you see, I'll just replace you. I'll replace you with people that aren't like you, don't look like you, don't talk like you, da, 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 da. That means a different language, doesn't it? Of course it does. So, uh, and a different culture. So, um, Muslims, as best as I can see it right now, are in a very, very precarious position politically, socially, spiritually, metaphysically, intellectually. Okay. You've got a bunch of people running around following thousands upon thousands of traditional lies and claiming that it's religion. And amongst these lies, Brother Karim has uh, demonstrated to us that, hey, you're not allowed to think, according to them. You're not allowed to use this cerebral pudding. And my God, that's one of the first things that I ran into. I started using my cerebral pudding, and they say, you can't do it. And you more so than other people, because you don't understand Arabic. I said, oh, my God. Well, all right, well. Look, I started out just like all the rest of you with this childhood uh, babbling, which is a uni universal language. We all speak it. We all spoke it in the cradle. It's the same language. And it's born a fitra. So my fitra is the same as yours. And you're telling me I'm not worthy? Please. I've had enough of this nonsense. People like me have had enough of this Arabic chauvinism. We've had enough of it. Okay. And it's time to change our Qibla, if you will, in the way that we think about what our beloved prophet brought us as al-Islam. Al and so with that having been said, dear brother, uh, let me hand the mic over to you with a, a question being, well, if there's anything else that you would like to add what I, to what I've just said or any other thoughts that you've had between last week and today, please, uh, I just leave the floor open uh, so that you can share with us what is on your heart and what Allah has placed on your mind at the moment, inshallah. Yes, uh, thank you, Brother Omar, for that and for having me uh, here once again to share thoughts with your good self and the listeners. Uh, before I begin, let me just do my usual. Yes, inshallah. Yes, uh, once again, thank you. And uh, 
I the one thought that popped into my mind as we you were talking about the person who wants to replace you uh, if you don't uh, you know toe the line. Mm. I I was thinking that well you could actually be quite lucky if that's all that happens to you that you can only get replaced <laughs> <laughs> because other people have suffered worse fates than that mm -hmm. they were basically uh, eliminated or disappeared vanished without a trace this is not mm -hmm. unknown you know? so we need to stay vigilant against extremism and. Um, this kind of, uh, you know, fanatical, you know, response by uh, some people. Now, in terms of uh, is, if there's anything new to share, yes, I would like to mention uh, there was a video that was posted just recently on YouTube by, by Javad Hashmi, who is, I think, a medical doctor, and, and he's also doing a PhD in Islamic studies at Harvard University. And... Um, he had on in his video, it's about the Hadith, uh, a scholar from a recent PhD graduate from Oxford University Press. His name is, uh, so, uh, sorry, from Oxford University. Uh, his name is Joshua Little, and they were talking about the, the Hadith. And uh, Joshua Little apparently has come up with 21 weaknesses in, in the Hadith. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, as a non-Muslim, he takes a somewhat different approach and he uses what he calls the historical critical approach, which is an approach mostly used by uh, non-Muslim scholars. And uh, I think that um, it's worth watching the video, although as a Muslim, uh, what, what we have done uh, subsequently, a friend of mine and I, uh, who is a Muslim from Bangladesh now, living in Texas, uh, working in the IT sector. We set up a room on Clubhouse to discuss that particular video and mm -hmm. share thoughts about it. And my take was that as Muslims, um, you know, we should take a Quranic perspective on the Hadith. Because I think once you take a Quranic perspective on the Hadith, your critique of the Hadith will be incomparably stronger, you know, and credible, I think. But mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that uh, I would say don't watch the video. I say, so go ahead, st still watch it. But certain questions that would be relevant to a Muslim mm -hmm. and very important for Muslim were never even touched upon, let, let alone discussed. So, for example, one such question would be, uh, is the Hadith, Bukhari and the others, uh, revelation? Yeah, Can we call it revelation? Mm -hmm. Can we say it's mm -hmm. coming from Allah? Are these words in the traditions uh, the words of Allah? Of course they are not. Well, then second question, are they the words of the Prophet? Well, I'm sorry, they are not even the words of the Prophet because they are paraphrases of paraphrases of what the Prophet allegedly said. However, mm -hmm. this point was, was recognized and they used a, an expression that even I had to look up. It's, it, it, the, the expression is paraphristic he said <laughs> they were referring I think that's to a new word <laughs> no actually it's in the dictionary it's just that i never oh is it yeah in, in okay. my years and decades in the academia mm -hmm. this is the first time i came across the word so i had to mm -hmm. google it and mm -hmm. apparently it just means like the word begins with para paraphristic it mm -hmm. just means uh, uh something whose meaning has been altered by paraphrasing yeah. Mm -hmm. So they were referring to the so-called paraphristic quality of the Hadith. In other words, that the meaning is distorted through, uh, you know, uh, non-verbatim transmission. In other words, yes, of the course. Hadiths are the words, actually the words of the transmitters. They are not the words of the Prophet either. So now uh, another question that would come up uh, would be important for a Muslim as well. If they are not the words of Allah and they are not the words of the Prophet, and if they are the words of transmitters, then how can we make these uh, these narrations uh, reports uh, a basis of islamic law legislation uh, which is you know even overrules uh, the revealed the rulings of allah ta'ala in the quran mm -hmm. uh, this is mm -hmm. absolutely stunning uh, catastrophic uh, corruption mm -hmm. i think personally mm -hmm. of the sharia mm -hmm. because the uh, the penal code part of the sharia because as far as I can see, legislation is the sole prerogative of Allah. There are many verses to, to confirm this. For example, when Allah says, La hukmu illa lilla, no one can judge uh, uh, except Allah. You know, uh, I, I think this is uh, referring to matters of deen. 
I mean, mm -hmm. we can make laws, uh, for instance, uh, uh, traffic laws and what, what have you, that, but that's got nothing to do with the deen. But the moment it comes to, you know, acts like blasphemy, uh, adultery or apostasy, uh, the, it, this is Allah's prerogative to legislate in these areas. So when the ulama basically allowed the man-made narrations to overrule the revealed rulings on, the, on these three, uh, you know, sins, uh, in one case it is a crime, they have actually, I think, fallen into what I am suggesting we could call a uh, juristic shirk because they have allowed a human being to become a higher authority than Allah himself. Whoever narrated those hadiths now legislates and his law replaces the law of Allah. Now, this is, this is uh, a violation also, of course, of, of the defiance also of the doctrine of Tawheed. So the, this is just uh, just a few examples of the problems that uh, arise from the unwarranted elevation of the tradition to the rank of revelation, and even to a rank where the tradition surpasses, you know, the uh, the revelation. And I have touched on this before in our meeting, but just very briefly to reiterate, you see, the the hadiths have uh, been uh, elevated above the Qur'an in uh, three ways. For example, when uh, it is said that the Sunnah judges the Qur'an, a Sunnah Qadi Allah Qur'an, clearly here we are putting the Sunnah above the word of Allah. So, But Allah presents the, the Qur'an to us as the Furqan, the uh, criterion of judgment. So how can we as human beings place another Furqan above this Furqan and say that now human beings are going to judge the words of Allah? This is really blasphemous, if you ask me. Please correct me if I'm missing something. And it is also uh, it shows extreme audacity and ignorance at the same time. So now that they don't stop there, they go further. They say the Sunnah can mm -hmm. only judges the Quran, but it can abrogate the Quran. In other words, the words of human beings can cancel the words of words of Allah. Now <laughs> I'm shocked again. How, how is this possible? How can a human being <laughs> abrogate or cancel the words of Allah? This is absolutely shocking. Yet, according mm -hmm. to Taha Jabir al uh, you know, uh, the uh, as early as 660, less than 30 years after the demise of the Prophet, the majority of the ulama, and by the way, Taha Jabir al is a Sunni scholar. He's not a Quran-centric chap. Although mm -hmm. he does lean towards the Quran, but he, he still uh, believes in the Sunnah as he understands it. So he says in his book, 2017 IT, that uh, less than 30 years after the demise of the Prophet, the majority of the ulama already agreed that even a solitary hadith can abrogate a Quranic verse. Now, please help me out what is going on. If this is not a catastrophic collapse of jurisprudence, I don't know what is. And, and the third one is uh, when the rulings based on a hadith actually replace the rulings of Allah. Mm -hmm. This is again catastrophic and also a manifestation of both uh, shirk and, uh, you know, uh, incredible audacity and ignorance, I would say, because now we are saying man-made laws are going to replace the laws of Allah. So, uh, and, and it happened in the three cases I mentioned already, apostasy, adultery, and blasphemy. Blasphemy mm -hmm. and apostasy are not treated as crimes in the Quran. They are treated as sins, meaning there is punishment for that in the hereafter, but not in the here. Adultery, yes, it is a crime, but it is punishable not by stoning to death, as the tradition alleges, falsely, mm -hmm. you, but a hundred lashes, and that has to be supported by the testimony of four reliable witnesses. Now, according to my uh, good friend, the, the late Professor Said Hussein Alatas, he informed me personally in one of our many discussions that in the entire history of Islam, in 1,400 years, there has not been a single conviction of adultery based on the four witnesses. Can you believe this? So, because of yeah, I, I often wondered about that, <clears throat> you, I, you know, because that's almost an impossible situation. Yeah. You know, when's the last time you know anyone who has actually committed adultery and let it be seen by four other people, other than you know, pornographic uh, experts? Um, yeah. I think uh, this is a, a very, very valid position, and uh, yeah. it one that, that that reveals the absurdity of yeah. the uh, juristic, um, what you call it, uh, juristic shirk. So we got paraphristic juristic shirk here. That's an interesting phrase now, isn't it? And I would like to uh, invite, uh, uh, welcome uh, Brother Tamvir, is it? 
Yes, welcome. Salam alaikum, brother Zanvir. He's one of Edip Yuxel's friends. We were together recently on a Zoom video, right, brother? Oh, very good. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. And uh, um, uh, please uh, take a moment to uh, tell us a bit about yourself, if you don't mind, brother Karim. Is... Uh, sorry, you want me to introduce myself? I'm sorry, go ahead. Say again. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to say a few words of introductions about myself? Of course, please. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I I live in the UK. I am um, a former teacher, trainer, and currently a psychotherapist. I work as a psychotherapist providing counseling and psychotherapy to local people. Um, so what else can I say? I'm a student of the Quran and... Um, you know, come to the view late in my life that, you know, the tradition that we have been fed as religion was completely a false basis uh, and it's created a religion which was not founded on the Quran. And therefore, uh, I'm in the process of um, well, reconstructing my life around what I know now or believe to be the reality, which is the deen given by the Quran itself. And Quran declares itself to be sufficient and sufficiently detailed and clear enough for ordinary human beings to be able to understand sufficiently to be able to live a, a decent life according to uh, God's system. Alhamdulillah. So that, that's, I mean, I don't know what else you want me to say. I'm a, uh, getting into the final uh, sort of part of my life. I'm not a young man anymore. <laughs> well, we've got a, we've got an old man's conference here. Okay. <laughs> that's it. Hopefully wise too, not just yes. old. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're trying to become wiser. Oh, we just lost Brother Tambir, but uh, maybe he'll uh, come back, uh, yes. sign back in. Uh, Amina, if you're listening to us, ask him to uh, sign back in. All right. So, uh, Brother Karim, uh, I, I like this idea that you've just brought, this phrase, paraphristic juristic shirk. That's going to stick with me, and I think we can use that as a platform uh, for further discussions uh, in this direction, in this realm, because now we've entered into the legalism that has uh, taken over uh, al-Islam. And uh, we haven't really discussed that before. We, you've mentioned it. and But this is, uh, and so forth, but uh, this is uh, something that we can uh, discuss a bit more concretely. Uh, I think now that we have this this, this wonderful platform, paraphristic juristic shirk. Oh my God, I love that. Now, what, what this means is, what you've said, uh, and before I hand the mic back to you, is that God did not establish a separate parliament, you know, amongst men. That's right. All right. Well so uh, so we, we don't have another uh, body of people who are going to uh, paraphrase, uh, who are authorized to paraphrase and reinterpret Quran uh, for us uh, exclusively. I mean... Uh, this means that, you know, ijtihad is not forbidden, you see, but it is not authorized as a legal position. And if you're going to perform ijtihad to the best of your possibility, to the best of your uh, talents and gifts and knowledge, then you always have to be open to revision in, in the event that, you know, hey, you've made a mistake. And how do you know you're going to make mistakes? It's because you're human, you see, and this is not revelation, you see. So, um, uh, if we're looking at the, the, the tradition, that's our very initial platform. Hey, these people are humans. This is paraphristic, okay? Uh, word, uh, you know, word of mouth by word of mouth by word of mouth, handed down over generations of almost 180 years before any of it's, any of it's really written down uh, to our to the best of our knowledge. And then it's uh, expanded beyond that. And as I mentioned, and as Fadlur Rahman, 
Rothman uh, made this wonderful book about the Hadith Wars, which no one at the faculty at ISTAC wanted to talk about. No one wanted to discuss that work, you see. So um, it, we have this uh, wonderful base now, paraphristic juristic shirk as the foundation of legalism, you see, uh, in Islam. And um, uh, this is ignoring the fact that, hey, all of this stuff was, uh, was a word uh, of mouth uh, 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 created by human beings who are subject to error. And it's not Al-Quran, which is not subject to error, it's subject to misinterpretation by error-prone humans, of course. But the Quran itself, no. So what has happened here is that these, uh, this uh, word paraphristic is awfully close to Pharisee, you see. <laughs> yeah. So what we, what we have is a bunch of Pharisees, a bunch of uh, Muslim Pharisees who got together and said, hey, we're going to close the doors of private interpretation and uh, forbid our followers the right to exercise their God-given uh, reason, you see anymore and they're going to have to follow us which means taklid is the rule of the day and we're the ones who are going to make the laws and we're infallible that which is the the vatican position where you know, the pope is infallible which they said about the shia uh, uh, caliphs by the way so the shia imams you know at the very top of their little fantastical um, pyramid so what we have is um, uh, a bunch of error-prone people professing not to make mistakes, saying that you've got to follow us, otherwise you're going to make a bigger mistake and we're going to make you pay for it in this life. Okay? And uh, then you get people like saying, who, you know, like the Malays in uh, 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 Malaysia saying, well, you can't come into our mosque because you're Chinese and you've never been to Mecca and you don't understand Arabic and uh, you're not Malay and uh, you go make your own mosque. <sighs> this is absurd. And they're professing to be Muslims. They're professing to represent, <laughs> to represent divine law, to represent divine guidance, to represent salvation, the path to salvation. Hey, the path to salvation is universal. It's the Tao. It's the way that is found towards truth, and you can find it in the book of nature. It's very, it's very open. You can read that book. Whenever I brought up that book, the book of science, you see, Muslims uh, were not interested in the book of science, uh, not at all. They were interested in how many times you have to wash your hands when you do voodoo. And how many germs are returned are removed from your hands when you do the voodoo? They considered this to be science, you see. And I, I attended uh, a couple of scientific uh, uh, Islamic scientific um, uh, uh, conferences when I was there, amongst them, and there were no scientific papers presented at all, none, no hard science. It was all this soft science having to do with the traditions, you see, what they said, what they remember. And the most, the people who were most impressive were the ones who could recite by memory, okay, these traditions. Now, since we have uh, uh, Brother uh, Tambir here with us as a psychologist, I would like you to explore that phenomena a little bit with us, if you don't mind, brother, because as a psychologist, you probably have some insight into the, uh, the social basis for this transfer of authority to those who can memorize. <laughs> what, what, can, can you uh, share any in, insight? I don't mean to put you on the spot. It's just that, hey, you're here. It occurs to me we're having a conversation amongst old men. Let's have at it. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, uh, <clears throat> my uh, personal uh, thoughts uh, or reflection on this subject is that over the years, the, the, deen, uh, the deen that is portrayed in the Quran has got replaced by religion. 
and religions are very much the same the world over whether we look at christianity judaism hinduism and others they're all based around a certain set of rituals that you know make people feel holy or saved personally and so the preoccupation is with with achieving personal salvation through do oh we've lost his transmission again personal salvation through certain ritual activities it, i imagine he was going to get there but uh well let's go back to it and we'll wait for him to join us uh there's something wrong with his uh, connection here so we'll just have to wait for him to sign back in but this is an interesting development now in our discussions to have someone like brother tambir join us all right because uh, there, there's wisdom in uh uh, th there's wisdom to be found in the number of counselors you see what we're talking about here what we're getting to and establishing here is a bit of a shura okay because i don't want people to think hey this dr omar is establishing a cult no no far be it god forbid no no that would be, that would be just same error you know another another sectarian persuasion uh and we've got the you know al ginko madhab you know, no, far, far be it from me, far be it from me to do that. So if um, uh, Brother um, uh, Tamir uh, comes back to us and maybe on a weekly basis, he can join us. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, we can form a little little old men shura here <laughs> and get back to it. So anyway, uh, let's get back to your thoughts in response to my uh, 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 comments that, hey, now we have a parliament established by men to help God out, you see, because God needs our help, obviously. So he's got a, we've got a parliament um, uh, of paraphrastic uh, jurists performing shirk, okay, and they're stretching the truth. They're stretching what uh, I, would, I would like to get Brother Tavir on, his perspective on the, uh, the, 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 the stretching the function of the left side of the brain, you see, and then they begin to stretch this out, stretch this out, and stretch this out, and develop all this mud, okay? Which is what um, Dhul Ar Karnain encountered amongst the people at the western shore where the sun went down, you see? <laughs> so um, uh, we've got the stretching of the truth, the stretching of man's perspective, and replacing the truth of the Quran with this man-made parliament of paraphristics. Okay. <laughs> oh, I love that word. I can't say it enough. <laughs> Thank you for introducing it to me. So, uh, what, what, what's your response to that summary, dear brother? <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, Brother Omar. Uh, the thought that popped into my mind as you were talking about the, the, the aversion to science among some of uh, our Muslim brothers, it reminded mm. me of a reference in uh, a book called Islam and Science, written mm. by uh, Perez Hoodboy, uh, who is a Pakistani scientist. The book is available online, by the way, free in PDF format. Mm -hmm. And in it, he refers to a conference which he attended, which was supposedly about Islamic science. And there was a fellow there who presented, uh, shared the results of his research that he conducted uh, and in which he tried to measure the temperature of hell. Oh, goodness me. Ah, okay. And so how did did he uh, did he descend into that russian mind shaft that went down so many miles and they could hear the voices of, i i don't I, know I how, have, did, how did he do this i have no idea because uh, this professor hoodboy didn't provide the details of how <laughs> how he carried out the measurement but i see so he he left out the section of the paper that includes methodology right yeah i don't know it's uh, this kind of science yeah, it uh, uh, reminds me what the, some of the Christians used to do. They used to argue about how many angels can sit on top of a pinhead. You remember? Yes, yes, yes. I remember these absurd, absurd things. Well, listen, uh, people do absurd things with the best of intention. 
okay? And um, if we get bro Brother Tom Beer uh, back here, we can discuss that um, a bit more in depth from a psychological perspective. But this is a fact of life. You can, you, you have people who have the best of intentions and they'll, 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 they'll kill you, you see, thinking that they're serving God. And uh, this is as far from service to divine guidance as we can possibly get. Because the taking of a life is like the destruction of all of mankind. That's something that the uh, Quran makes uh, very, very uh, clear. So if they're willing to do that, if they're willing to do what you have harped on so many times in our discussions about to go to war once a year just to make sure that they're taking dominion, you see, in the name of God, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, then uh, God forbid. This is this is absurd. So you have people with good intentions performing evil deeds, you see, and calling it, as Brother Tom Beer just said, religion, okay? And it's no wonder that uh, people will then look at uh, Muslims, especially in today's days where they're blowing up people on buses and, you know, uh, uh, whatnot, um, and say, no, no, I don't want any part of that. And as I uh, said before, if I had depended upon the melee um, uh, representation of al-Islam, I never would have made the conversion. I would never would have crossed over from Christianity to uh, Islam. It just wouldn't have happened. So my conversion was heartfelt based on an intellectual comprehension of what it is that I read in Al-Quran through a imperfect translation, but nevertheless, the translation carries the message. So that, that means that there's something supranatural, not super, supranatural about Al-Quran, you see. And I say supra because that's a more, more of a scientific term. It's above what we perceive to be the natural. Okay, it's not separate from it, it's above it. Uh, and that means that there, well, there's something about Quran that we don't understand, you see. And uh, we, we don't need a parliament, you know, of uh, people who tell us, well, you can't think anymore, just believe what we tell you. And uh, we don't need such a parliament to help us to understand that we don't understand everything about the Quran. Uh, we do need a group of shura, or of people who are uh, dedicated to a conversation, an ongoing conversation that helps us to unravel this knowledge, to uh, uh, reveal it, to perform the apocalypse, which is the revealing of something, you see, and the expanding of this knowledge. When you think about taqlid, it is a contraction of knowledge. It's not an expansion. So if you're going to contract, that means you're cutting off, you see. <laughs> you're cutting off uh, what otherwise would be guidance. And I come back to this time and time again with my approach to these conversations and others that, you know, where is the guidance? Where's the fruit of this guidance? Where, please show me. And the closest thing I can get to the fruit of this guidance is a lot of good people with good intentions who are running around um, in confusion, you see. They have good intentions, they've got a good heart, they know that there's a God, they call him Allah, and they know that Muhammad brought the last of the messages that we can discern and they know that they're dedicated to this but between them and their god is this layer of this this parliament of paraphristic jurists you see and <laughs> um, and <laughs> and and um, you know so if there's if there's this layer it's like the catholic uh, catechisms it's that that they put their own book there you see so they, 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 you know, the Muslim, the, the, the church goer, the rug kisser is trying to get through to heaven, but they got this book and it keeps on, they keep on banging their head against it, you see. So 
what uh, <coughs> excuse me um this is a terrible position to be in because i see this futility and i've had many and i'm sure you've had many young students coming up behind you and saying where is the relevance of islam how how do i make this relevant how how have you responded to these uh, students dear brother well, yeah, you see, I um, before I would begin my lectures, and I was uh, hired mainly to teach English, uh, Shakespeare in English, and uh, creative writing, uh, subjects mm. uh, dealing with, uh, you know, uh, communication, English, and so on. Um, so uh, I, w but however, I would still spend maybe the first 10 minutes or so of my class, as I mentioned, I think in one of our earlier talks, doing a little sort of a getting in touch with the reality out there in the real world, sort of like a mini chutbah of my own, so to speak, where I would mm -hmm. share some thoughts with my students and mm -hmm. from time to time discuss the, the odd issue. But I found that whenever I touched on the more sensitive, uh, you know, issues, for example, death penalty for apostasy, uh, my students became very reluctant to, to discuss it. And I remember even one of them in the back, a boy saying, oh, that's that's Akida or whatever. I, I'm not touching that. That's basically what he was telling me. Mm -hmm. So I found it almost impossible to talk to my, my students, you know, about uh, these issues relating to the Sharia. Another time I tried to bring up the question, well, if the penalty for uh, adultery is stoning to death, how come Allah Ta'ala did not include it in the Quran? Mm -hmm. uh, because he apparently included the penalty for uh, fornication, which is sex between unmarried people, 100 lashes, that is the traditional explanation, but the, the, the punishment for, you know, uh, adultery, which is a worse sin, because uh, here a, a married person is having sex with someone other than mm -hmm. his wife or yes. husband. So I was asking, well, how is it that Allah would uh, have included a penalty in the Quran for the smaller crime, but uh, not include the punishment for the greater crime? You, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yes, because yes. If uh, it is punishable, then how come the, the only the punishment for fornication is present and not for adultery? Uh, of course, the, the answer is that uh, there is no punishment of stoning in the Quran for adultery. Mm -hmm. That has come from the Hadith once again. The mm -hmm. Judas, and according to Muhammad Shahrur, by the way, in his book called uh, Quran Morality and Critical Reason, which is the only book that has been translated into English from Arabic, uh, it's available, by the way, online, free in PDF format. I highly recommend it. It's my number two source, so to speak, after the Quran. I think it's the uh, best book on Islamic uh, issues that I have come across anyway mm -hmm. today in the literature. Of course, there are others, but he is very direct. He takes the bull by the horns, so to speak, and I like that. He doesn't beat around the bush. He goes right very into good. the bush. Excellent. Yeah, if you like, yeah. He took mm -hmm. a fair bit of flack for that, of course, but um, mm, I'm sure. anyway, so I found that I, after a while, when I uh, saw this um, reticence on the part of my students, and also another thing I noticed in that student, or uh, some mm -hmm. of the students, when I touched on these issues, uh, the, they s suddenly, the, some of them, or at least I remember one clear case, the student began to look demoralized, demoralized. Yes. And, uh, yes. and that really shocked me because I have been a teacher for 20 years. I spent 20 years in a classroom full time in mm -hmm. Canada, uh, three years and the rest of it here in Malaysia. And uh, I see the purpose of the teacher as uh, uh, to demoralize a student is one of the worst things a teacher can do. Mm -hmm. Our job is to do precisely the opposite, is to raise the spirits of the, raise the morale of the students, to give them confidence, yes. rather than uh, to demoralize, because the moment you demoralize your student, you demotivate him, and then he will not yes. want to learn anything at all. This is a very, yes. very serious. In fact, uh, we know from the Quran that Iblis, the word Iblis actually means uh, someone who is in despair, you see? Mm -hmm. So we as teachers, we are not supposed to plunge people into despair. We are plunging them into the arms of shaitan, if you like. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I immediately stopped talking about it and I changed the subject and I rarely came back to it afterwards, mm -hmm. you see, because I think they are not ready for it, you see, for this kind of discussion. Uh, the, these were mostly students who came from religious schools to me, you see, from mm -hmm. Johor, Kelantan. They all attended these um, uh, yes, yes. 
madrasas and what have you. They were fine students, don't get me wrong, very well-behaved, uh, very polite, very pious, mm -hmm. all that. They've got all, and, and they were smart too. It's not that they were not intelligent, they are. Yes, yes. It's just that they were taught not to think that much or not to think too much, especially mm. about matters relating to the dean, to, 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 to oh, the faith. Yeah. And I think this is a very, as I mentioned in our discussions before, I consider the repression of reason or rationality to be the four of the big mistakes that uh, the traditional paraphrastic jurist and Mufasirun you know, committed. <laughs> yes, yes, so yes, yes. I think to, to snap out of it, the Ummah has to go back to the Quran, as our brother Tanvir, I think, also would agree. And But before we can go back to the Quran and begin to understand it, we need to do something else as well, which is to start using this one here, the Akkal. Mm. It won't yeah. do you any good if you read the Quran without using this one, because our mm -hmm. students already know how to read the Quran, and That's they will true. read it to you beautifully, but without comprehending almost very little, completing very little of what they read. Now, this is this is just unbelievable. So they give you the impression of being knowledgeable of the Quran, but the reality is that they are quite ignorant of the content of the Quran. And it is not only the students who suffer from this. I have had people from different parts of the world tell me the same thing. Mr. Abu Karim, I know how to read the Quran, but I don't understand anything I read. I had people from yes. uh, Bangladesh mm -hmm. tell me this, from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Malaysia, all yes. over the place. This is a yes. global phenomenon. This is a new kind of jahiliya, actually, you see. Yes. And, we, and what is uh, particularly pernicious about it, if you ask me, is that it is being disguised by the beautiful recitation that these very same people can do. So that hides the problem. The problem is lack of comprehension. And this is due mm. to the uh, very bad teaching of our, uh, you know, paraphristic juris or ulama who tell the people, don't use your brain when you, when you read the Quran. You are not capable of understanding it. The Quran is too difficult. They are completely contradict Thing what Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, where he says the Quran is easy to understand. You see, four yes. times repeated in Surah Al-Kamar, verses 17, 22, uh, and uh, uh, two, two other verses. And that it is a clear book. The, uh, the mm -hmm. Mufasir are telling us, no, it is not a clear book. It needs us or the Hadith to explain it, as if Allah needed help to make himself clear. This is very disrespectful, mm -hmm. not only to the Quran, but to Allah himself. How yes. dare they make such statements which fly so directly in the face of what the Quran, what Allah is teaching us? And now doesn't Allah tell us also the Quran is coherent, that we will not find, uh, you know, contradictions in it? Well, what do the ulama yes. say? Oh, no, 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 no. There are many, many contradictions uh, in the Quran, anywhere from <laughs> five to 500. Are you ready for this? Yes. 500 contradictions and they need to be resolved. They invented a new methodology, a very corrupt methodology called the, uh, the theory of abrogation. Now they are abrogating the words of Allah. They themselves yeah. are doing it, yet they are putting yeah. the blame on Allah, saying it is Allah who abrogated the 120 peace verses in the Quran by the verse of the sword, uh, Ayah Saif in Surah number 9, verse number 5. What lunacy! You know, mm -hmm. uh, the Sheikh Muhammad Ghazali of Al Azhar University calls it, and I'm quoting him, pardon my harsh expression, but it's not my words, it's his words. He calls it, I quote, crassest stupidity, end of quote. Yes. The belief in yes. uh, the, uh, the abrogation of the peace verses by the Ayah Asad. So, what we see here is probably something worse than just uh, paraphrastic uh, juristic shirk, a complete collapse of rationality. Would any reasonable person make such statements and even subscribe to the doctrine of abrogation? This is mm. like catastrophic, but please mm. correct me if I'm overstating the case or, but I just cannot believe this. I'm still, well, after all these years that I've been working on it, I'm still trying to digest it as it were, to come to grips with it. This is a, this is a phenomena that uh, mm. strikes the Muslim student and it's a slap in the mm. face that's very, very difficult to uh, deal with. Um, and uh, from a psychological perspective, I would like to to ask uh, Brother Tom Veer what he has to say and maybe return to the uh, the answer that he was uh, giving a few minutes ago. Welcome back, Brother. Um, what, what I see happening is that um, there's a certain amount of conditioning uh, that takes place in all, as it does in all political bodies. Uh, in, you know, in the Muslim body, instead of saluting the American flag, they're saluting the Star and Crescent. So, uh, and this is, uh, this, this conditioning begins at the, you know, the, 
on the knee of the uh, parents and, and, and is continued with the madrasa. And they are conditioned to just memorize, uh, repeat, they become parrots and it becomes a communal community obligation. And it provides its own safety net. So it's terribly difficult to withdraw from this safety net. Okay, you have to have a certain degree of um, uh, protean character in order to do this. Um, so, uh, Brother Tanvir, let me uh, ask you again: How 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 does this uh, this whole phenomena work from your perspective? How have you seen it work against the Ummah, against the community, and what kind of problems are you seeing as a psychologist as a result of this? Yeah, I apologize for the interruption. I don't know, my internet is working fine, but maybe it's the first time I've used this platform. And, mm. so, and I, I've sort of gone to the trouble of signing up. So I'm hoping that it will stabilize. Yes. Uh, so I, I apologize for the interruption that happened earlier. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a Muslim, Sunni Muslim household. Um, so I have lived through uh, most of the experience that, you know, are experienced by the Ummah, the, the Muslim Ummah, and because I've seen them at close quarters. And yet the, this conditioning does start indeed uh, from birth, you know, from the, when a child is born and somebody wants to say the azan in the ear, yes. the, you know, the whole, the whole process is set in a fabric you know, of uh, culture and rituals and events and festivals and celebrations and all the rest of it. So it's very much fabric of a whole society. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I would say fundamentally there's a vested interest by the priestly class, as mm -hmm. there always is, uh, who hold the keys or the, they are the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. uh, to the religion and uh, you can understand this better if you realize that you know when people have vested interests they do not want people to bypass them because they become irrelevant if they do so yes. the so-called learning islamic learning is primarily to memorize what has already been thought out by other people either in the past or present so the students really pride themselves in how much they've learned from other people's uh, conclusions and, and problem solving that has been worked out maybe in the fourth century or, or whatever. They are mm. not, they are not uh, encouraged to do any critical thinking or, or to use their brain. Uh, that absolutely, that's number one, you know, kind of sin is to start mm -hmm. thinking for yourself because that would be really, really very, very dangerous. And people are frightened off very mm -hmm. early on in their life not to start thinking. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, it becomes very, very difficult for somebody who's mm -hmm. lived their life Im Im uh, immersed in such a community to actually start thinking individually for themselves. It would need a heroic kind of a response, the sort that we cited in the Quran for Abraham. Mm -hmm. He he alone stood up and saying he looked around and he he realized this was all wrong, mm -hmm. uh, and he's he's, he's he's therefore held up as a beacon of uh, example of you know, and in fact, Prophet Muhammad is also uh, told to follow the example of Abraham, because he stood up against all this priestly class and the spinners of uh, and the controllers of knowledge in any society. And, mm -hmm. and this has happened uh, very forcefully in, in, in the Islamic uh, religion. You know, uh, to, to some extent, the Christians and the Christianity and, and Judaism have sort of like fallen by, by the wayside, largely mm -hmm. ignored by the societies in which these relig religions exist. 
but Islam is very much uh, still in power. And by that, I mean the priestly class is in power in a very mm -hmm. active manner. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's that's the number one obstacle uh, that that you know prevents people from doing any kind of ind independent thinking. The Quran has largely been put to one side as bringing of blessings. So you know, if if you are told that every letter of the Quran that you pronounce gives you ten blessings to be counted, you know, on the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, then people are, as I said to you earlier, that they are preoccupied with building this uh, bonuses in the hereafter. Mm -hmm. They're yes. really not interested in the in the in the world around them. Mm -hmm. uh, just to give you an example, a very recent example, only yesterday, uh, my wife received a, a text message on a WhatsApp, uh, a recorded message from mm -hmm. a, a Muslim lady. Uh, who is alerting all the other Muslim ladies to be to be on the lookout for the start of the month called Rajab, because it's such a holy month mm -hmm. that God has named it as you know His month, mm -hmm. and, and therefore you know uh, you know there are great uh, rewards for fasting in this month, which mm -hmm. will lead to. Uh, Gates of uh, uh, gates of hell being closed. If you fast for mm -hmm. seven days, if you fast for eight days, then the gates of heaven are open. And if you mm -hmm. fast for another ten days or something, uh, something else happens. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, so she's virtually guaranteeing salvation mm -hmm. uh, in this month for any anybody who wants to take this up. And she gave an example of a lady who had something really important to do in terms of going out shopping to purchase something for her family. But she mm -hmm. put that to one side and instead decided to fast. Oh, gosh. So this, was, yeah. this was more relevant. And she would then uh, expect on the Day of Judgment mm -hmm. to see immeasurable rewards offered to her by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he will... He will say, this is what it amounted to, what you could not see. Your fasting has led to this, and your recitation of the Quran has led to this, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was a complete fabrication and a lie, mm -hmm. because there is not a mention of the month of Rajab in the Quran, let alone God claiming it as a holy month. Uh, so, you know, I encourage my wife to respond to that and say, well, this lady is... Uh, telling a complete fabrication because she's mm -hmm. referring to the Quran and there is not there's not a single word in the Quran regarding this phenomena that she's that she's talking about. Mm -hmm. So I'm afraid this is where the state of the um, so-called Ummah is. Mm -hmm. It's personal salvation and expectation that somehow because we are born in a Muslim household and called Muhammad or uh, something of that nature, that on the Day of Judgment, we're going to get special treatment because mm -hmm. all the other communities are going to be cast to hell. No mm -hmm. question asked. Uh, but the Muslims, uh, some of them may well be, be subject to punishment, but mm -hmm. of course, uh, with Muhammad's um, intercession, mm -hmm. there is no question that we will eventually end up in paradise. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Even if you spend 40,000 years in hell. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the hope, I mean, there, there is a, some, somebody was re, re, reading some uh, tradition to me and saying that uh, when all the judgment has been done and all the, you know, things of God has judged everyone and sent whoever he wants to send to hell and send others to paradise, mm -hmm. then uh, there will be one man still sitting and uh, and it will be prophet muhammad and mm -hmm. god will then ask him what are you still doing here it's all done and finished with now mm -hmm. and he will say well how can i go to paradise when some of my people are still in hell mm -hmm. so because he's so beloved of god eventually god will have to relent mm -hmm. uh, to his wishes and take out all the Muslims he's accidentally put into hell. 
Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is not that far different from the salvation that Christ earns, you know, the Jews, I mean, the yes. Christians. Yes. And, 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 and the Jews claiming that they're not going to go to hell because they are, you know, children of uh, uh, Abraham or Benin. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they are God's children, you know, special children. Mm -hmm. Mm. So, so Islam or the Muslims have really come to very similar uh, points uh, in their development, mm. uh, uh, just like different names and places and uh, things, but it's exactly the same. It's become another religion. Yes, it has. Well, thank you, dear, dear brother. Um, I want to welcome uh, Sister... Annie. 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 Hi, Annie. Annie Zonadel. Hi. Hi. Yes, Annie. welcome, sister. Good to Please, see you. Um, I'm Dr. Omar Zaid. Welcome to this um, little uh, discussion. I'm so happy to see a lady join us. I can't tell you. I'm I'm so very, very pleased. Alhamdulillah. Annie, Thank would you, you uh, please introduce yourself uh, to our listening audience because this will, will be published. Uh, even oh, if sure. you're only with us for a few minutes. Uh, tell us uh, about yourself and how it is you, you came to join us. Okay. So my name is Annie Zonneveld. I'm the founder and president of Muslims for Progressive Values. I'm based here in Los Angeles. And um, I've been uh, very active in uh, the advocacy of human rights in the context of Islam. So a lot of discussions that you've been having today is very relevant to the psychology and to how um, how the actual, well, pardon my language, but the bastardization of Islam sure. is in, in the field itself and how it impacts real people. So this is the sort of work that I've been doing for 15 plus years. Um, and um, um, I am a fan of uh, Abdul Karim, who I listen to all the time. And I met Tamdir at the uh, <laughs> Oxford uh, Muslim mm -hmm. uh, um, launching organization uh, last mm -hmm. year. And so I'm pleased to meet you, uh, Omar Zaid. Uh, so my question is, um, this has been very... Um, uh, you know, we were talking about contradictions early on, and I'm just wondering, what is your take on the Surah of Lut, Prophet Lut, where he, where he was giving up his daughters to the rapists? And I've really never been able to rationalize through this um, this particular verse or this the way it's being interpreted anyway. And and by the way, I am Malay from Malaysia. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, however. Uh, the way I was raised, uh, Alhamdulillah, I was not raised uh, in a mosque community, and mm -hmm. that has lar is largely because we traveled, we lived abroad most of the time, and mm -hmm. so my Islam is really the examples of my parents who exuded nothing but um, equality and egalitarian va values towards all people, regardless of race, religion, um, and so that is what have shaped my Islam. So if Wonderful. someone could address that verse, that would well, be great. Let, let me take a stab at it. I mean, I, I don't recall the verse itself right now, and I'm no Islamic uh, uh, Quranic scholar. But uh, from what I understand of this verse, um, uh, from the Talmudic perspective, from the biblical perspective, uh, Lut was confronted with a horrible situation. And... Um, uh, rather than insult God by allowing the, the angels, you see, to be uh, molested by the citizens, he offered his daughters instead. It was more of a gesture. And I'm not sure that he was prepared to go through with it. But uh, listen, when you're in, in, in situations like that where life and death is um, at, the, uh, at stake, you, you know, you have to make certain decisions almost instantaneously based on uh, what those circumstances are. I know as a doctor, I have to make, I had to make life and death situations, decisions based on the circumstances and the limitations of the uh, tools and the uh, uh, people at my um, at my disposal uh, in the in the emergency room. So certain people 
who presented had to wait. Others were more in were in greater danger of losing their life, and I would have to attend those uh, first. And those who were in greater danger, sometimes they couldn't be saved, and I would have to make the decision. Well. We have to leave them and go to the ones who could be saved. These triage decisions are made instantaneously based on experience, based on knowledge, and based on what you uh, uh, perceive of the situational awareness, you see. Uh, so I, I, I imagine that Lut was faced with a very, very difficult situation. I'm not sure that he was informed as to how powerful these angels were. Uh, perhaps at the moment when he, uh, uh, when they knocked on his door and he allowed them entry, they just appeared as human beings, you see, and um, uh, he didn't know what they were really there for uh, until afterwards. I don't know. Anyone else have a, a take on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it is a difficult uh, passage uh, to really explain away so easily, but it could be a combination of things. Uh, it's alluded to as this is what uh, Luth said in response when he, he felt an imminent threat that his guests, his honored guests, would be attacked. Uh, we don't know what the gesture was either as to what he means that here are my daughters, uh, because he knew that one of the issues in the in that community was there was uh, there was very lit, little interest in those people in in his daughters uh, and uh, the, just as you were talking there was one other thing i was it was coming to my mind as to i'm not sure how many people actually were uh, with Luth when he was actually eventually saved from that community. We know that his wife was left behind. Uh, and so I'm not even sure which, how many members of his household were actually of, you know, the same like-minded or who were part of that community. So we're not told any, we're not given any information about the, the state of uh, mind of his daughters whether they were part of they were his group or whether they were part of the general community. Uh, so there's, there's a whole host of unknowns. So I wouldn't like to just hazard a guess as to what he meant and what he was trying to do and so on, except that one gets the impression he felt an immediate danger of attack mm. his uh, honorable guests. And, and, and because they were in his house, he was, you know, the tradition is that he's responsible for their health and safety. Yes. Which was paramount in his mind. And I suppose, you know, whether it was your sons or your daughter, whoever was around, you would put them up there to ward off the attack. No. Uh, so that's as much as I can say. I, I, I can't couldn't say any more mm -hmm. about it that would make any sense anyway. Uh, yeah, if I may, uh, the way I recall reading that uh, verse in Abdullah Yusuf translation of that verse, he he adds a, a certain expression in brackets. Well, after he says, "Here are my daughters," and then he opens a bracket and he puts to Mary, and then he closes the bracket. Yeah. Uh -huh. So according to that translation, he was offering these people to marry his daughters, not to you know take hold of them straight away and mm. you know whatever. So he was saying, here are my daughters to marry. Now, whether that is the correct rendition of the verse or not, or whether there's a better way to render it, maybe I should raise this question with Brother Edip Uxel. And by the way, Sister Annie is a good friend of Edip Uxel. I don't know whether you knew that. So we have here a, a gathering of uh, uh, the friends of Edip Uxel. Have you ever <laughs> yes. met Edip, by the way, yes, Brother Omar? Yes, I had one session with him last year, and then we never managed to connect again because his schedule was uh, uh, not conducive to arranging another meeting. And we, we did, and on that occasion, I had a bit of an emergency, so I had to cancel. We never followed up. But I'd love to. I love Brother Edip. Yeah, I mean, he's just wonderful. He's, uh, he's one of the brightest minds on the planet's surface right now. 
And uh, I'm very, very honored that you, his students, and his compatriots have uh, decided to join this uh, WE session. I, I'm hoping, uh, frankly, uh, that uh, we could continue uh, on maybe on a weekly basis or you know, whenever it is that you can, can meet. Now, you see, Brother, Brother Karim and I, we have established a pattern now. It's our habit to meet. Uh, every uh, Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, New York time. So if that's comfortable for you, please, uh, dear brother and sister, please uh, uh, join us uh, because this is a wonderful opportunity to expand this conversation and to include uh, other perspectives. The greater, the more perspectives we can uh, uh, we can entertain the, 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 the more we can expand our knowledge and understanding is that's my position. I, I don't want to be exclusive, although there are what I call people of the mud that I, I don't want to waste my time with. And um, so and I think that brother, you, your brother Edip is also, um, you know, very conscious of his uh, use of his time and I don't want to waste uh, time with people who are just going to present futile art arguments or uh, questions that have nothing to do with the subject matter other than to defend their indefensible positions. I, I don't want to entertain those kinds of um, conversations but if we can expand our knowledge base and I'm including here knowledge is based on experience you see now i think between between all of us here we've got a, more than 100 years worth of human experience uh in different venues that will be of great benefit to uh, whoever it is that allah allows uh, uh to 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 join us or to listen to these um, these conversations as we publish them on the internet so i'm so happy to see you and i'm particularly happy sister ani to welcome you i've been waiting and waiting and waiting and praying for uh, a, a a feminine presence here uh, a woman who um, can articulate uh, uh, her position solidly concretely and to uh, not just challenge the 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 male position but to complement it as it's supposed to be complemented you see, so welcome, alhamdulillah, God bless you for, for, for taking this uh, small step. Um, so with that being said, if there's anything that anyone wants to add before we close here, because we've been on air for over an hour now, and I don't want to, uh, uh, to test the patience of our listeners or even each other. Anyone have anything to add to what we've just been discussing? I, I thank you for the, the kind words, Omar, but I just always want to close on a, on a positive note because yes. it's easy to be to feel in despair uh, with mm -hmm. the state of the Oma. Um, but from the work that we've doing, we've been doing uh, in human rights context, and I've been working in Africa a lot, as well as in Malaysia, there is a real awakening of, of, of what the real Islam is. And we're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, verse of verses of um, countering the verses or the interpretation of the verses on domestic violence, for example, or mm -hmm. even re retraining imams in how they teach children. So mm -hmm. we actually have curriculums in madrasas that actually teach the values of the Quran and not just memorizing the recitations and the verses. And so this is actually really having an impact in the societies that we've been working on. So I just want to share with you that Inshallah, the next generation is going to be better. <laughs> oh, wonderful. I'm so happy to hear this because you see a person like myself, I'm now kind of step back, uh, kind of like the, from out, if you, you take a person like me out of uh, the, the example is the, the uh, Hindu culture at the village level. You see the elders like me, we, we retire at about the age of 70 or so. And then they place us outside the camp. So we have our own little cubby hole, our own little cabin outside the camp. And we have nothing to do with the uh, happenings, the decisions that are made in the camp. 
you see, by the next generation and uh, their people. So that, you know, our families and those who love us, they would bring us our meals and make sure that we're taken care of. And, um, and every once in a while, uh, after they uh, would bring a meal, they would sit down with the elder and say, I have a question for you, grandfather. <laughs> you see, and uh, then uh, the grandfather would lend his ear and then say, you know, they've got a problem. How would you solve this? What would your approach be? And then the grandfather, the grandmother would make a, uh, a contribution, a suggestion, you see, based on experience, knowledge from experience, you see. And so I'm in that position right now. So, Sister, I am so happy to know what's going on in the camp. <laughs> Thank you very much. And you please try, try to keep old folks like me informed because um, uh, we just uh, kind of sit back and um, uh, we're not involved anymore, but we still have something to offer. And I like to think of myself as someone who's sort of facilitating this kind of exchange, you see, of information, of knowledge, of wisdom, of experience, of of, uh, of anything that's going to help the coming generations to uh, learn what they need to learn in order to survive and improve their actual experience of survival as servants of divine guidance. <laughs> you see, so I, I welcome you and uh, Brother Tamir. Oh, very, very wonderful to, to have you. Uh, I, I would like to, to have your, so we have, what we have is we have academia represented here by Brother Karim, a very, very solid foundation. We have an active uh, uh, female uh, presence in the sociological realm who's actually not just talking, but doing wonderful. I'm so happy about that. And we have a psychologist who's, uh, you know, if you had a beard, you'd be going like this, you see, <laughs> and, and you're re reflecting and um, we it can bounce our, uh, our, our own thoughts and our own queries off of someone like yourself. So you can become our private Jordan Peterson, you see. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So with that having been said, anyone else want to add something before we close? Uh, 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 Brother Omar, you must be aware that there is already a session going on Friday, every Friday by Eden, mm -hmm. uh, the Quran study session, uh, mm. which he only started two weeks ago. Oh, uh, I see. So I think, you know, um, it might be an idea that, you know, we try and pool our gathering so that, you know, more people can benefit mm -hmm. um, because time is going to be issued in trying to coordinate different times. And I, I am aware that I'm not going to be able to be present ev every week at this time. I couldn't mm -hmm. do it. But I have appointments, you know, mm -hmm. I have clients to, to see to. Uh, as much as I would love to, I think there should be more and more of these occasions for people who are focused on the Quran to connect and uh, support each other and to give each other moral support to continue the good work that they do. Mm. Uh, I definitely think that we are somewhat isolated because I, def I, I do find it difficult to reconnect with my old community anymore because I am just not on the same <clears throat> same same page anymore. Yes. Uh, yes. So I think uh, this is one of the thing is to to break this isolation you know, for more and more people who are Quran centric uh, mm. to connect or find create more opportunity to do so and not hide. We have not, nothing to be afraid of. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you, brother. Please join us when you can and keep us informed. I uh, uh, I will depend on one or the other of you to send me that link for Brother Edip's uh, Friday and uh, uh, sessions. And if I can join, I will certainly join in with you. Alhamdulillah. I'm sure my wife Amina will as well because she's keenly interested in these things. So 
Uh, with that being said, Brother Karim, you have anything to uh, say before we close? No, uh, not really. Just I would like to welcome our two new uh, visitors and guests, and I hope that you will. We will see you again, <laughs> uh, or as much as is possible. By the yes. way, that uh, that uh, meeting with Brother Edip, he is holding it Fridays at twenty one hundred hours GMT. Yeah. So mm -hmm. maybe that's five a.m. Uh, in the morning, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, I guess one has to make sacrifices from time to time. But I don't know about uh, the others. But yeah, let's hope that we can synchronize this uh, in a way that is meets everyone's needs and is compatible with everyone's commitments and schedule. But once again, welcome to our new guests, and uh, inshallah, we'll you know have another excellent discussion the coming week. Thank you very much, brother. Then, with that having been said, I will say wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.